Today we're speaking with Diane Crampton, and, and she is the founder of Tiger's Success Series. So, Diane, um, before we start this topic uh, on supply chain change facilitation, can you provide a brief background of yourself? Certainly, Dustin, and thank you for having me on your program. It's great to share content with your um, with your tribe. <laughs> uh, I've been in the business of work group development uh, for nearly 30 years now and it all started from a question and that question was what's necessary to build an ethical quality focused productive and successful group of people or maybe a group of companies like in supply chain that come together uh, to bring and drive products uh, onto the marketplace and uh, so I studied all the group dynamic information I could find in business education and psychology. And out of that study came six principles that are measurable. They are readily seen and experienced in how employees treat one another, the customers and the supply chain on a daily basis. And those six principles are trust, interdependence, genuineness, empathy, risk resolution, and success. And then after these six principles came together, then the, the, the project was to prove whether or not they could be individually measured within group behavior. And two years later, and after uh, two independent studies that were conducted by rather large uh, organizations, uh, the results were conclusive. Not only could these six principles be measured individually within organizational behavior, they could also predict and prescribe treatments that would take, a, let's say, an underperforming organization or maybe even an adequate one into the excellent category in rather quick, in a rather quick time frame because these six principles are at the very core of cultural behavior. They influence how your vision, uh, how the company vision is manifested. They influence how um, the vision folds and folds. They, they, it, they influence whether the organization or values actually have a living presence in an organization. So there, it's sort of a universal principle system. And uh, I've been doing that ever since uh, the proof came through, hung out my sh shingle and have worked in merger work, have worked in building organizations, uh, have worked in change dynamics for organizations. Um, going on almost 30 years now. Thank you. So my first question is, can you talk about the steps that are involved in the process of change facilitation? Well, change is, it used to be, in fact, Peter Drucker and others that were very germane in, I guess, in launching my career, uh, have said that change can be a three to five year process. And I agree with that up to a point because many of our change uh, uh, situations have taken 18 months uh, to resolve. So we were far shorter under time and under budget in that three to five year category. So when you look at change and, and, and an org, a leader is anticipating change, there are a number of steps some of which I think are ignored. And um, the first step is really assessing what the behavior dynamic is of your organization. In other words, how do people treat one another really on an ongoing basis? Maybe it's not what the le leaders see. Maybe these are little interactions between employees. Uh, we call, uh, I call, uh, that behavior, sort of your community of influence. This is how things are really done in a company. This is how the behavior really is in a company when nobody's looking. <laughs> and uh, those behavior dynamics, if they're not lined up correctly, let's say an organization has a very poor trust performer, 
then there is some trust building that needs to happen before change is rolled out and executed. So the very first step is to make sure that the behavior dynamics in the organization can actually handle the change uh, uh, dynamic. Then from there, there's a planning process that's involved. And it, it, it's, it's like I've seen leaders just dive right into the execution planning phase without identifying uh, the communication strategies, the marketing strategies, internal marketing strategies, uh, the time frame of rolling out those strategies, who they are going to pull in to the, uh, to the change strategies. I think leaders often think that, well, since I'm in the executive team, it is our role to execute change. And yes, it is. But it's also their role to engage the workforce and uh, the informal and formal power structures within the organization to get behind that change, to actually look forward to the change, to understand it. And then part of that communication strategy is also to pull in those individuals sort of in a cross-functional type of team to uh, work through how they're going to communicate this change in advance so that, I'm going to call it safety nets, are put into place for employees because change often threatens people, Dustin. And uh, when you have executives, you have managers who have um, become very good at, at performing tasks and services within an organization that's going to undergo change, giving up that sense of security um, for excelling what they excelling at what they currently do. It's really difficult to go back to ground zero and learn something new, especially when your department, uh, your revenues, your financial streams, and everything are on the line. So in addition to the communication strategy, that's built, there's also sort of an enthusiasm building strategy that comes with that communication strategy. And part of the safety net also is to identify the types of norms of behavior and the norms of uh, uh, procedures and procedural norms that you want to lay down and put into place uh, during that change process so that everybody's on an even playing field and you can corral all your organizational diversity into those group norms of behavior. So there's a couple of documents, there's a couple of procedures and, and rolling out uh, conversations uh, through your formal and informal uh, power structures that create a feedback loop from employees back to the executive team in terms of what's needed <laughs> uh, to build that safety net, what type of communication is going to be expected, who is going to roll out that, ex uh, that communication strategy, how are you going to reward little steps within that change process that, are, that people achieve, um, and what that all looks like. And that is all handled before you get to the execution planning phase. Then when you get to the execution planning phase, you already have support teams in place um, for rolling out the steps of that change plan. The faster you roll out change without a safety net, uh, the more resistance you're going to experience. Um, the faster you roll out the execution process with communication strategies and safety nets already put into place and expectations on behavior put into place, rewards and recognitions for even the smallest little successes in that change process, uh, change can be escalated considerably. So each of those steps, of course, is broken down into uh, sub-steps. Uh, but I think that's 
probably too much for this, too much minutia <laughs> for this conversation. I don't want your listeners to have their eyes roll back in their heads and, and uh, uh, think it's overwhelming because it's not. There is a strategic plan strategy. And if any of your listeners want to go to my profile on LinkedIn, that's at Diane Crampton, Diane spelled with two N's, on LinkedIn, there is a, an article that I posted on there on Change where I list the steps. And they're welcome to go there and check it out. Uh, it's free. <laughs> and uh, uh, it'll, it'll fill in all the little substeps, substeps between those uh, three major categories, which is communication strategies, your safety nets, and uh, communicating that to employees, then developing the execution strategies and your execution plan. Uh, could you talk about uh, the challenges that you face when, when doing this change facilitation? Well, in and I'd like to focus this on supply chain, Dustin, because um, if you look at all the different companies in a supply chain uh, to drive a product onto the marketplace, hopefully uh, uh, with a deflation number on it, right? Uh, if everybody is really efficient in the supply chain uh, and there's not a lot of waste, rework, and time lost, clearly deflation is a good thing because it keeps the price down and makes your product competitive on the marketplace, right? So when you look at uh, all the different pieces and all the different companies that and their corporate cultures, that are involved in a supply chain. The, the group norm uh, of behavior piece that I was talking about in terms of the, like the Tiger Six principles are really important to making sure that you can deflate the price of a product, the end product uh, within a supply chain dynamic. But when you have, let's say, a company that is in maybe a or more autocratic country uh, that has more autocratic uh, management and leadership styles, where employees within that company may not be trained and developed uh, to be collaborative with high levels of exchange of information and information sharing within that company, perhaps they're not cross-functionally changed. Uh, trained so that if a highly trained employee gets sick one day, the whole production closes down because there's nobody who can uh, step into that uh, job by that employee is ill and out of the office. So when you look at the training and the development of employees within that organization, you have that culture. <laughs> then you have another culture, a company that's completely different, that has uh, different levels of training and employee development, and yet another and another and another, depending on how wide and deep your chain is. So the challenge is, um, is really to impart that the, the, the whole, I'd say heart and soul of supply chain is collaboration and not competition. When you have a highly, com uh, when you have a highly autocratic uh, culture, business culture. Employees are very dependent. <laughs> uh, they rely, uh, they're not paid for what they think. And as a result, they are very dependent people. And maybe not as collaborative or even capable of collaboration as a company that is more team-based, agile, lean, Six Sigma, and we can go on and on and on in terms of uh, the systems and the strategies that they deploy within that company. So I, had, I read one paper once, Dustin, that, that likened a supply chain to a big company with different departments. Well, I would argue that if you have one department that feels like Hawaii, <laughs> it's fun and it's sunny, and you get work done and you still have time to go out and surf, that's great. When that employee from that 
department goes into Siberia, <laughs> where where uh, the whole management structure is different. I call that culture split. I also call that a toxic organization. So the challenge is to to build collaboration within that supply chain, and that is often uh, done through training and de- development of, of the key drivers in the, the supply chain. An example would be GE. I had uh, the great occasion to uh, learn from one of the HR managers and training development folks internationally uh, for GE. And that company's uh, procedure is actually to bring in vendors, to train vendors, <laughs> <laughs> and to bring them in to um, uh, large organizational training and development types of meetings where they can get the, the key leaders of the chain together and actually build relationships and understanding about how each person is key, each company is key to be able to deliver a, a deflated price product onto the marketplace that's competitive and therefore ensures that that supply chain and their position within the supply chain uh, stays strong and secure. So there's the, not only the, I think the challenge is that not only do you have the training and development of, of employees within each member of the supply chain, you also have that need to build synergy and collaboration within the chain itself. Does that make sense? Um, yes, and um, well, so following this, that the last thing you said, um, can you talk about how do you overcome the challenges? Well, I think the way you, you uh, overcome the challenges is bringing the people together. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, again, when, when you're looking at a ch- supply chain, there's lots of hands-on interactive types of activities. And I'm not talking about touchy-feely stuff. I'm talking team building things. I'm talking about uh, really nailing down uh, group norms and procedures that work for the entire chain. In other words, what are the behaviors that we're going to have within our chain that are going to keep trust high so that if we do have a problem, if we do have a conflict that comes externally, <laughs> you know, there's there's a high level of understanding and less suspicion, less defensiveness in overcoming those problems. So it's determining what behaviors that chain wants to see and experience and expects um, working together that would keep trust high. And it's the same thing with interdependence. I mean, we have technologies now, Dustin, that are fantastic. Uh, Members of the supply chain can use, um, uh, you know, a a computer system, almost like a project management system uh, for communicating uh, where they are in the process because we know steps in the chain itself take a lot of time. I mean, just getting a sample out uh, that everybody agrees with, with can take a lot of time. <laughs> and then ordering can take time. The whole manufacturing process can take a lot of time. So uh, working through the interdependent pieces uh, and, and the behaviors within that supply chain help to overcome, um, I'm going to say those dependent type of organizations where employees cannot make a decision to solve a problem on the spot without executive overwrite when that executive is attending some uh, a high level meeting in Switzerland you know I mean there's so many things that can happen within that chain and then how do people how do people um, bring problems to the, in the chain uh, to the group for resolving some will be just individual um, business problems. But what happens if, if environmental conditions um, 
shift within a company. We're thinking of all the flooding, for example, in uh, in Puerto Rico and, uh, from the hurricane. Uh, they had a nice coffee business starting. Well, maybe they were supplying beans somewhere. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, these these problems occur, and uh, you have to have the group norms developed and the collaboration agreements uh, there where people have met face-to-face -face and have built them together uh, with real meaning and value to be able to deflate the price of that end product because everything is so efficient and streamlined as much as possible. So I would say overcoming those challenges, training and development organizationally in the individual organizations so that if somebody is out, there is somebody who can step into their position and there's not any lost time and waste of resources. Uh, and then also collectively within the chain um, to, uh, to meet together, hammer out some agreements and uh, really instill the value that the ch if the product survives, the chain survives. Um, and those good working relationships uh, uh, will keep, I, I'm going to call it like the end user from switching vendors for, you know, a nickel price drop in, in, a, in a piece of the supply chain. Daring today, Diane. Pardon me? Oh, thank you for sharing today on, on this topic. Oh, you're very welcome.